Hello and welcome to Dr. Bond Science Theater. Today we're going to be talking about water chemistry. Let's look at a simple ionization. On the left you see HA, that is an acid. And on the right you see A negative, that would be its salt plus a hydrogen ion. But the double arrows, one pointing each direction, means that it's at an equilibrium. So in this equation we have a weak acid and we pull the proton off of it and now we've created the salt. Okay, so looking at this formula, the salt of a weak acid can accept protons, like it's negative. Okay, it's lost a proton, that's why it's negative. And the acid can replace protons if something is taking it away. And remember that a proton is not acid. A proton is what the acid has donated to the solution. And the higher the concentration of protons or hydrogen ions would be the higher acidity that we have. Okay, so review. If I dump in 100 HCLs into a solution, what happens? I get 100 hydrogen ions because immediately they're all going to dissociate. Now if there is a weak acid present that's at equilibrium, so we have some available um, weak acid salts that are ready to absorb some protons, and it depends on which weak acid you're using on how much it can absorb, and that's why we have a, a Ka value for each, because we the Ka value is telling us the ratio of the weak acid to its salt. But say we dump in those same 100 protons into a solution, a certain percent of them are going to be gobbled up by the acid salts of the weak acid. So it will be able to buffer to an extent. Now there's going to be a point when you add too many protons that, you know, forget it. Your buffer is going to go off the chart. If you add a weak acid to water that's just water molecules at a pH of 7, then you're going to lower the pH but not as greatly as you would have with the HCl. Why? Because not all of the weak acid are going to lose a proton to the solution. It's going to be a certain percent. So say for example I add 100 molecules of weak acid. Let's say that only 10 of them lose their hydrogen and become an anion. So then we have 10 that are available to absorb a proton when we add more to the solution. Now let's go back to the equilibrium constant for this acid. So we're going to call it sub A for the acid. Now the formula is the concentration of hydrogen ions times the concentration of the salt divided by the concentration of weak acid that we started with, HA. When we're talking about equilibrium constants, we're talking about weak acids. Because strong acids like hydrochloric acid, HCl, which is what you have in your tummy by the way, but anyway, these are strong acids and if you were to put it in a solution of water, you know what happens? It's kind of like, I think his name is Nelly. He it says, it's getting hot in here, let's take up all my clothes. Well, that's what HCl does. As soon as it gets into the solution of water, it dissociates. So if we were looking at an equation like this, we'd have HCl yields hydrogen ions and chloride ions, and that's it. I mean, everything splits apart. We don't have equilibrium, okay? All of it is going to dissociate. All of the hydrogen ions are going to be removed, okay? So that's a strong acid. So a strong acid completely ionized in a solution. So we're not going to be talking about equilibrium or buffer systems when we talk about um, strong acids. Oh, I love water chemistry. Yay, 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 yay. You know what pH is? It's a negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration of water. That is going to be equal to the pKa. What is that? It's a negative log of the Ka. The Ka was the equilibrium constant constant, just a constant. That means you have a chart. That means we already know what they are. So we're going to plug in a value for the pKa depending on the acid that we're using. Easy. And then you're going to say plus the log of the salt over the acid concentration. That's it. It's a very, very simple equation. A useful shortcut to get from pH to pOH if you want to know the concentration of the hydroxide in the solution. Here's the following relationship. pH plus pOH equals 14. Remember, we got that from the product constant, Kw. So for example, if a solution has a hydrogen ion concentration of 6.2 times 10 to the negative 6, its pH would be the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which is pH is 5.21. So if we have that value, all we need to do 
is take 14 minus the pH equals 8.79. Can't get any easier than that. Okay, so acetic acid, that's a weak acid. It has a pKa value that is known of 4.76. So when you're gonna be calculating a buffer system for acetic acid, what are you gonna put in the pKa? You're gonna look at the chart, oh, it's 4.76, I'm gonna put it there. So you already know what that constant is for that acid. It will never change. And what is this constant for? It's a measure of how strong the weak acid actually is. So say you walk into a gym, do you think that everyone lifts the exact same amount of weight? No, they're not all going to have the same strength. Some of them are going to be strong or there's going to be varying degrees of people that are just starting their program in their week. Um, same thing with acids. They're all going to be defined by their constant that is going to be saying how weak they are. Now, here's something that might be a little counterintuitive. The one that is a stronger weak acid will have the lower pKa value. So don't get that confused. So for example, acetic acid, I said was 4.76. Formic acid, which is three something. Formic acid is gonna be a stronger weak acid because it has a lower pKa value. Okay, so is there a pKa for strong acid? Well, no, because remember this is an equilibrium term. So I've already told you there is no equilibrium. It's a one arrow thing. All of the protons are gonna dissociate, so HCl will not have a pKa value. So let's look at the henderson hasselbalch equation again. Since the pKa is a constant and it doesn't change ever, then what this equation is saying is that pH is gonna change as the concentration of the salt and the weak acid change, okay? Because remember, they're a ratio. So as those numbers change, as the concentrations of the weak um, acid and its corresponding salt change, then the pH changes. And that should make sense because as you increase the amount of hydrogen ions in the solution, you become more acidic, and as you decrease them, that you become more basic. If you increase salt, what happens to the pH? Well, just look at the formula and you can tell that the pH is gonna go up. And the flip side of that is if you decrease the amount of salt and you increase the amount of the weak acid, what happens to the pH? It goes down, which means that you've increased the amount of acid, which makes sense. Okay, let's talk about the equivalence point. Whenever you have an equal concentration of the acid and salt, so say if I were to plug in some values into this equation for acetic acid, if I had 10 uh, moles of the salt divided by 10 moles of the weak acid, then what is that gonna equal? One. And what is the log of one? It's zero. So at that point, the pH is going to equal the pKa value. So I'll say it again, when the concentrations of the salt and the weak acid are equal, pH is going to equal the pKa. With a monoprotic acid, we're gonna see one of these equivalent, equivalence points. If you have a diprotic, which means that you're gonna lose two protons, if you have a triprotic acid, in the case that you're gonna lose three protons, I'll show you an example, then you're gonna have three different pKa values, and therefore you're gonna have three different equivalence points. Okay, so what if I said that the pH was eight and the pKa was four? What could you tell me about the solution without having to use a calculator or anything? Well, what you can tell me is that there's more salt than there is acid. Because if we have a positive ratio that means we have a positive logarithm and we're going to have an, a larger pH than pKa because remember it's pH equals pKa plus the logarithm of the ratio. Okay, so if you have a larger pH than the pKa, you know that you have more salt. If you have a lower pH than the pKa, you know that you have more of the weak acid. Okay, so why do we care about pH? Let's look at a couple of examples of enzymes. Here we have two enzymes, and we're going to look at the various pHs and their activity level. The first one is chymotrypsin, which is duodenal enzyme, and so we would expect that to be optimal around the duodenal secretion, which is slightly alkaline, and of course it is. Look, it's optimal, it has the highest activity at a pH of 8, which is what we would expect, because um, remember we have that acidic chyme coming from the stomach, and we need to hurry up and raise the pH so we don't damage the 
the duodenal lining. So on either side at you know too low of a pH or at too high of a pH, it's not going to be active at all. So our enzymes are going to be very specific, very optimal at a certain pH. And it will totally vary on where it is. Obviously, stomach enzymes are going to be optimal at about a pH of 1.5 to 2 because that's the pH of inside of the stomach due to the hydrochloric acid. Uh, duodenum is going to be around an 8. Um, our blood is at 7.35 to 45, so 7.4. Pepsin is a stomach enzyme, and as you can see, it's going to have an optimal activity at about a 1. Point, looks like 7.5 uh, to 2. And then, of course, dropping off at doing nothing by the time. So if there's any enzyme left by the time it gets to the duodenum, the pepsin's already done its uh, job. But then the chymotrypsin's there, and it's going to start doing its job. Again, we'll talk about what enzymes do later and how they specifically work later. So what even happens if, say, our pH of our blood gets too far from 7.4? You're going to start damaging the proteins in your body. Oh no, not my proteins, why? Because your proteins are going to be extremely specific for the pH. We're going to discuss a lot about proteins and their optimal pH when we get talk about the proteins and their functional groups on the amino acids and, and their individual pHs. If we're out of our pH range, then we're going to start damaging proteins. And if you damage a protein, what are you doing to it? Well, you know how specifically proteins are folded? very specific. If you're damaging the protein, you're going to disrupt that folding. But you should know that the folding of the proteins is going to determine its function. So if you unfold it, if you damage it, then it's no longer going to function. And you don't function as an organism without your proteins. Okay, so let's look at a titration curve. So here we have OH because we're adding probably sodium hydroxide um, in specific equivalents and as you see the concentration of hydroxide increasing you're going to see the corresponding increase in pH which makes total sense from what we've been talking about. So with that said look at our pH of our weak acid this is acetic acid titration curve and what you're going to notice is it kind of flatlines for a while and that's going to be its buffering range or its buffering capacity and this is going to be the pH range in which it is it is an effective buffer. So it typically will go one pH above and below this point um, of the pH is equal to the pKa. Remember that is the equivalence point. And in this case I told you that the pKa is 4.76. So the point at which the pH is equal, remember this means that the concentration, and you can see this on the graph, of the salt to the weak acid is going to be equal. Okay. So one pH unit above and below are going to be the buffering capacity. Beyond that, you see how the pH just skyrockets or goes way down um, when we go beyond this range. And here we say the buffering region or capacity, one unit before and uh, above and below. Um, if you can see uh, the top pH, you can see that all of it is going to be in the salt form. And at the bottom pH, you're going to see all of it's going to be in the weak acid form. But if you typically put it in water, you're going to see um, where it's equal, the pH is going to equal the pKa. This is a monoprotic acid example, meaning that it only has one proton to lose. And what does OH do when you add it to a solution? It takes away protons. And remember that if you're acidic, you have a higher concentration of protons. So as you add this NaOH, you're taking it away. So it should make sense that the pH is going up as you add the sodium hydroxide, or here, you're just calling it hydroxide. Buffers do not resist pH at all pHs. So they're only going to be effective within a specific range. So therefore, the buffer is going to have the maximum capacity to resist pH when pH equals the pKa, because that is where we're going to have an equal amount of the salt versus the acid. If you go too far either way, specifically one pH unit either way, then you're not going to have enough salt or you're not going to have enough acid. So the optimal pH is going to be at the pKa for any given buffer. Okay, with the triprotic acid, um, it's still a weak acid, but it just means that it has three hydrogens that it can release. So it's going to logically have a pKa value for each time it releases one of those hydrogens. Oh.
<laughs> this is Brenda the Not-So-Good Witch signing off for today. See you next time on Dr. Bond's Science Theater.